Alrighty, welcome back everyone. Um, let's get started with chapter five, the working cell. So in this chapter, we're gonna look at how the cell functions, how we transport molecules in and out of the cell, uh, how molecules move so that the cell can man maintain its normal structures and different things like that. So let's talk about some uh, basic energy concepts. So first things first, we're going to talk about energy. What is the actual definition of energy? We all know what it is, but let's define it. The definition of energy is the capacity to perform work. So that means the ability to move objects or alter temperatures. Um, we call this work or heat. There are two different types of energy. There's kinetic energy and there's potential energy. Kinetic also means movement. So kinetic is the energy in motion that's being used. Generally, we're converting this to heat. Potential energy, though, is stored energy. So we're not using it right now, but we could use it if we needed it. Um, this dam, for example, all the water on top has huge amounts of pressure. So all this water up here, that's called the potential energy. As the water moves through down here, this is what's called the kinetic energy. So kinetic movement potential, it has potential for you know, energy. So another example, person on bike, they're moving up this hill, they're putting energy in, they're burning calories with muscles, and they're trying to get to the top of this hill. Once they're at the top, there's no kinetic energy, but now there's potential energy. So no movement, not kinetic. And now all they have to do when they're at the top of this hill is move slightly forward and then roll down. So what happened here is potential energy was converted to kinetic energy as this person moved down the hill. And as they're moving, they're using, they're losing energy as friction or heat. So now let's look at the laws of thermodynamics. Um, the first law states that energy can be converted from one form to another, but it can't be created nor destroyed. So you'll have equal energy before and after, but it'll look different. So see here, we have a solid block here. We have some stripes. Uh, we can convert it from potential to kinetic or to heat, but we're not, we're not going to be losing. We're not going to be destroying it. It's just being changed. So heat is a type of kinetic energy. It's energy in motion, kinetic or moving energy again. And that's the mo movement of molecules and as we heat them. So as we heat them, they move faster. And anytime we have energy conversion, some of that movement will be removed as heat. So it'll move out and go elsewhere. It won't be destroyed. And that energy is randomized, which is entropy. Entropy is that randomized energy. Molecules, they want to be random. They want disorder. So to put them in order, we have to put in work. For example, if you spray perfume in one spot, that's not random. So all of those molecules want to spread out so that there's equal likelihood of finding them anywhere. Um, and you don't know where they are. So if you ever spray perfume and you smell it really far away, it's because those molecules have moved. That's entropy. The second law of thermodynamics is that everything goes towards entropy, so towards this disorder and chaos. Um, both of these examples down here are pretty good visuals of something ordered that wants to move, and that is moving towards disorder. So highly ordered, not so much over here. So laws of thermodynamics review. The first law, basically energy can never be created nor destroyed. It's just changed from one to another. And then the second law, um, entropy increases, basically. So ordered 
to disordered. Then we have uh, chemical energy. Chemical energy is one form of potential energy. So we store energy in bonds, means we're not using them at the moment, but when we break those bonds, uh, we release that stored energy. This is how plants and animals work. Plants do this through photosynthesis. They take sun energy, convert it to um, chemical energy. They break bonds to release and do work. Animals do this uh, via cellular respiration. And we're about to talk extensively about photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Uh, to put this into more real life perspective, um, car, we have these hydrocarbon, and by real life I mean daily life, all of this is real life. But anyways, to put this into a daily life perspective, um, we have this car, we have these hydrocarbons right here. Uh, we have combustion to break them down. That gives us heat and then kinetic energy moves the car and then we have those waste products. With a cell, it's the exact same idea. So we have food molecules, so sugars, fats, proteins that we eat, um, and they go through cellular respiration at the mitochondria, so our little powerhouse of the cell, our little workhorse, and that's where we make ATP that our cells use for energy. So cellular respiration, this is uh, where chapter six starts, and we're going to get a little bit into this process. So in cellular respiration, we break down sugar using oxygen to make ATP. And photosynthesis is the other step there. Remember, um, only plants go through photosynthesis, and that's how they make sugars and we eat those sugars and so on and so forth. So when sunlight goes in with photosynthesis, you need carbon dioxide and water. And you have these reactions where we convert sunlight into chemical energy. Plants have chloroplasts that do this and they also have mitochondria for cellular respiration. We only, uh, animals only have mitochondria for cellular respiration. We do not have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts aren't plants. But anyways, um, when plants make sugar, they can break it down to do work that their cells need to do, basically. Let's move on to some food calories. So what is a calorie exactly? Talking about sugars, we have to talk about calories too, don't we? Um, a calorie is the amount of energy that takes one gram of water and increases its temperature by one degree Celsius. So both of these pictures show water to assess the amount of calories inside of the food. So when we're talking about food, we talk about kilocalories, thousand calories. When you look at the amount of calories that anything you're eating, that means for each one, you can change a thousand grams of water by one degree Celsius. And now back to some sales. So as I briefly mentioned, the mitochondria is where cellular respiration occurs. Now we'll just touch on that and move on. So structure of ATP. What mitochondria makes is called adenosine triphosphate. So the A is the DNA base, and the TP is the 3-phosphate, so triphosphate, 3-phosphates. In the mitochondria, we're, we're building up these very high-energy ATP bonds, and to release this energy, the cell breaks this bond. So right here. The little squiggly line shows us. And what we're left with is a D piece, so adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates. And then we have this other phosphate just hanging around out here. And then 
what mitochondria does is it can put that other phosphate that's just hanging out right now back into the process and we can have ATP again. So back on to here is for ATP. And this is a cycle. So we have ATP, we break a bond, release energy, get ADP plus P, then we build it back. We build it back up again in the mitochondria from the fuel molecules we've just eaten. So we complete this ATP cycle at the chloroplast and mitochondria. So photosynthesis chloroplasts. Chloroplasts in plants make the sugars, and the mitochondria break those down to make ATP that our cells can use. Plants have both chloroplasts and mitochondria, so they can do all of this by themselves. Um, they're autotrophs. They make their own energy. Whereas non-autotrophs, so heterotrophs that have to get their energy from of either other heterotrophs or other autotrophs by eating them, um, we just have mitochondria, so we can't make our own energy. We have to get that energy by eating it and breaking those nutrients down to make ATP. And we have these two equations here that we look at when we talk about photosynthesis and aerobic respiration or cellular respiration. So aerobic is with oxygen. If oxygen was not here, we would call it anaerobic respiration, but I'll get into that in a second. But if you'll notice, the equations for photosynthesis and aerobic respiration or cellular respiration are very similar but flipped. So the products are the reactants, the reactants are the products. And when we flip them. So this is the equation for cellular respiration. Glucose plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. So we here... Glucose and oxygen, C6H12O6 plus 6O2. Here we have our reactants. So this is what we're putting in. And here with carbon dioxide, water, and ATP, we have our products. Oxygen is very needed in aerobic respiration, cellular respiration. Um, we breathe. We literally breathe for this. Um, but let's go back to this equation. So we've eaten our sugar, so we've eaten our food, and we breathe in our oxygen, and these go through these three steps, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, which is also called the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. And at the end of these three steps, we've got lots of ATP, between 30 to 36 generally, and we also have water as a product, which is good because our cells use it. We also have carbon dioxide um, as a product, which is not great um, because if it build, builds up, it's very toxic. Uh, so we have to breathe it out, which we do. So step one, we have glycolysis right here. Glycolysis means sugar breakdown or sugar splitting. So glycos are glucose lysis splitting. So we break down glucose, the six carbon sugar, down to two, three carbon pyruvates. So a pyruvate is a three carbon sugar. If there's oxygen present, that pyruvate moves on to step two of our cycle. Um, but if we do not have oxygen present, that pyruvate gets converted to lactic acid. So this is when no oxygen happens. This is called anaerobic respiration. And this is what builds up in our muscles. Um, if we work out a lot, a lot, that's what the soreness is. It's lactic acid buildup. So anyways, if there is oxygen, so we see oxygen is here, that pyruvate moves on towards the Krebs cycle. So it moves on towards step two. So, like I said, the Krebs cycle will also be called the citric acid cycle, so don't let that confuse you. It's the same thing. It's just two different names for the same thing. Step two of this process. And here we take those three carbon sugars, the pyruvate, and we break them down until we get six carbon dioxides. And here each carbon 
becomes a carbon dioxide molecule. Um, then we make some ATP, but mostly in the Krebs cycle, we have these electrons that carry the hydrogen ions or the hydrogen atoms that move on towards this next step. And so our last step, the electron transport chain. In here, the hydrogens move through a pump an ATP synthase pump, and each one that goes through is able to make one ATP. So this is, during the electron transport chain, is where we make most of our ATP. And by the end of this pro whole process, we'll get about 30 to 36 ATP. And the hydrogens go into water. So if you can get what goes in and what comes out and the three general steps here, you are golden. So let's move on to photosynthesis to see how we make that glucose and oxygen. Plants use light energy and they need carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight energy to go through photosynthesis. So what happens at the chloroplast is the light depend dependent reaction, so this is where we need light, and then light independent reactions where we don't need light, so it just happens at nighttime, so Calvin cycle. Without getting into too much detail here, basically light goes in, we make molecules that go through the Calvin cycle, and by the end we're able to sugar and we've made oxygen. Um, a big problem with deforestation, for example, is that too much carbon dioxide is being left behind. Whenever we do this, uh, we're not putting enough oxygen back in, and that's no good. Um, plants are really important to us, to our livelihoods, for sure. And then we have these different specialized structures or systems in plants. Um, super cool thing. Different plants have different ways of uh, photosynthesizing depending on their environment. We have C3 plants. So C3 plants are plants that you'd think of. Um, C3 this means uh, they, the first thing they convert the C in the carbon is in, carb in carbon dioxide is into a three carbon sugar. And C3 plants, like I said, are the ones that we would think of. They live in cool, moist conditions under normal light, and they are the most efficient at photosynthesis. C4 plants are a little bit more complicated, um, but photosynthesis happens faster because carbon dioxide is delivered more quickly to the four carbon sugars, and that's what the C4 stands for. Um, C4 plants have four carbon sugars, and corn is an example of this. Then we have cam plants. Cam right here. Um, this would be like different cactuses, different plants that are in really dry climates. Um, they don't want to lose water, and they're most efficient at water use. All plants have stomata, which are structures or little holes on leaves and cells that open up to take in carbon dioxide. However, in areas that are dry, um, plants developed this thing where during the day the stomata will be closed, so that they don't lose water, but they'll be open at night to take in that carbon dioxide that we need for photosynthesis. Um, here you can see the stomata is slightly open during C4, and then during C3 the stomata is completely open, making it the most, well C3 is just the most efficient just given the climate and everything else. So now let's move on to enzymes. I know I've touched on these before, but we'll talk more about what they do right now. Uh, they make reactions go faster. Simply, that is what enzymes are there for. Um, they define our metabolism. Very few metabolisms happen without enzymes, and those that do go very, very slowly. Uh, enzymes are very specific. One enzyme to one reaction. So depending on what kind of enzyme is in a cell, we can determine what's going on. So different types of metabolisms, different cells, we can tell what's going on just by seeing what enzyme is inside of it. 
Uh, activation energy is why we need enzymes, why reactions go really slowly without them. Before we can do a chemical reaction, we need to overcome this activation energy by putting energy in. So what enzymes do is decrease that activation energy. They make this uphill slope right here smaller. Here we have an activation energy barrier. Our reactants right here, here too, we throw in this enzyme, it pushes that barrier down, it lowers that barrier, the activation energy, and we get easier movement from one side to the other. And how do they do that? They have what's called an active site where the substrate or the reactants bind in. So this is the enzyme, this is the enzyme's active site. You can see how they fit in like puzzle pieces. This is called induced fit. And that's why each enzyme works on only one reaction. It's got this active site, brings them in, helps the reaction occur. And here you can see how the enzyme changes its shape slightly. It's right here. You can see how the enzyme changes its shape slightly as the substrate binds. And then we get our products. Notice how the enzyme has kept its original shape once we get over here. So original shape and then last shape. Hasn't really changed, right? No parts of the, this tells you that no parts of the enzyme come off. Um, and this enzyme can do this reaction millions of times. And the word we use for making that reaction occur is catalyzing. So it catalyzes only one specific reaction. Here's another example of the substrate coming together with the enzyme at its active site, and they form what's called this enzyme substrate complex. So when they're together, it's this, it's this word, enzyme substrate complex. And this is a picture, just an example of how this can happen over and over and over again. A good analogy for enzymes is that an enzyme is like a wrench. There's a specific size for a specific bolt and we can use it over and over again on those same size bolts. We don't need to buy a new wrench, right? Right. So just a little overview. Enzymes don't make anything happen that couldn't happen on its own. They just make it faster. Um, reactions don't change the enzyme. And then number three is kind of iffy when it comes to biological systems. So it says the same enzyme usually works for both the forward and reverse reactions. True, but in biological systems, they will usually just go forward because when we make one reaction in our bodies, that product will go on and do its thing without looking back. So reactions wouldn't intuitively make sense to go backwards in biological systems. And then the last one, um, each type of enzyme recognizes and binds to only certain substrates, so it is very, very specific. It's very choosy. Also, note here um, that you'll know it's an enzyme if it ends in ASE, so catalase, helicase, polymerase. Remember earlier I said you'd know if it's a sugar if it ends in OSE, like glucose. You'll know if it's a protein if it ends in IN, like uh, actin, hemoglobin. Same with enzymes. If it ends in ASE, it is usually an enzyme. So catalase, helicase, polymerase, things like that. So moving on to our next important section, membrane transport. We've discussed that plasma membrane is selectively permeable, so only certain things can cross it. Um, and for those that can cross it, we'll have transport proteins to help things pass through. So large molecules like sugar can't pass through selectively permeable barrier, so it will need a transport protein to help it get in or out of the cell. So it's important to look at how molecules want to move. So first we're going to talk about passive transport. Passive means we don't need to use ATP or energy to move molecules. It's passive, it's lazy, it does what it wants. The first one we'll look at is diffusion. Um, this is passive. Uh, molecules move how they want, again. This goes back to ter thermodynamic, thermodynamics and entropy. Uh, the molecules want to spread out, and by moving around randomly, they spread out. 
A great example here is drops of food coloring. You can see the dye is slowly diffusing through the water and it's moving throughout until all the molecules are spread out and moving around. And here you can see that they look pretty spread out in that water. And here are two different examples. Uh, example A is passive transport of one type of molecule. So this is the dye example from the slide before. Once equal on both sides, we've reached equilibrium. So here we're at equilibrium. Equilibrium. Example B shows passive transport of two types of molecules. So purple is highly concentrated on the left and low concentration on the right. right? We don't see any purple on the right. So what it does is it wants to move down its concentration gradient. So it wants to go from an area of high concentration to low. Purple on this side high, purple on this side low. We don't see any. Whereas the red dye has a high concentration on the right, but low on the left, right? So we see a lot of red on the right, no red on the left. So this also wants to go down its concentration gradient and go from high to low. So in the red's case, it would be from right to left. And by the end, at equilibrium, we've got everything pretty evenly spread out. So molecules, they want to move down their concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And then we have another type of passive transport called, called facilitated diffusion. So this is still passive. This is still going to be moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Um, and this is for molecules that can't pass the plasma membrane on their own. So they'll go down the concentration gradient, but they can't do so by themselves. They need something like a transport protein to help them. For example, we have a protein channel, which is an open space for it to go through from an area of high to low again high to low concentration, or we'll have a carrier protein. So the carrier protein will grab it, it will change its shape, and it will move it to the other side. But again, this is from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And next we have osmosis. Um, this is a special case in which the solvent is moving around. So the solvent is generally going to be water, and we'll be talking about osmosis and water. So again, water is the solvent that will be moving. Water spreads out. It wants equal concentrations on both sides here. If we put lots of salt on the right here, water will want to move to the right to help those be equal, so to help dilute it, if you will. Here's a good example. Um, we've got a membrane right here in the middle with the yellow dotted line. We got sugar molecules on each side. Here we have um, a lot more sugar on the right side, which means we have sugar that is highly concentrated on the right. And then on the left, we see that we have more space for water. So water has a higher concentration on the left. Again, water wants to make the concentration the same. Sugar is too big to fit through this membrane. But what's not too big is water. So water will move towards the right to spread and equal out those concentrations, as we see here. So water has moved to the right. This is lower here, this is higher here, but we got isotonic solutions, so equal on the left and right. So we use tonicity when we compare the concentration of solutions. And this is always a comparison. In hypertonic solutions, we have a high concentration of solutes. Um, they're hyperactive. They have high energy. In a hypotonic solution, we have a lower concentration of solutes. So this is low energy. And then in an isotonic solution, we have an equal concentration of solution. So when comparing solutions, and they have equal concentrations, we know that it's an isotonic solution. Here in this left cell, we have a hypotonic solution, but remember, this is, again, a comparison. 
So the solution, the blue right here, is hypotonic comparatively. And the cell would be hypertonic. So inside the cell, there are higher concentration of solutes. Outside of the cell, in the solution, there is a lower concentration of solutes. So the solution is hypotonic. The cell would be hypertonic. Conversely, on this side, the solution is hypertonic, so higher concentration out here, and the cell is hypotonic, so inside hypotonic, but the solution, what's outside of the cell, the solution is hypertonic. In our bodies, it is very, very important to be isotonic. So for example, water balance in animal cells. Our red blood, so these are red blood cells. Our red blood cells are interesting because they are in our plasma, which is a pretty watery solution. And when they're active, they have no way to regulate water movement. So our blood needs to be at the same level of solute as our blood cell. It needs to be isotonic. If not, water can enter or ex exit the red blood cell and the red blood cell can't control. If we put really watery solution here, oh my goodness, where's my mouse? Okay, so let's say that this is in a really watery solution. There's more solute in the cell. So water will wanna move in to the cell, so H2O in, to try to balance that out. And that would cause the cell to swell up and to lice or to burst. But if we put the cell in a really salty solution, um, so really hypertonic, so hypertonic down here, um, there's less solute in the cell and water will want to leave the cell, which will cause that cell to shrivel up, which is not what we want. We want normal red blood cells, so we want it to be an equal solution or an equal concentration inside and outside. Plant cells are a bit different. The cell wall really prevents plant cells from changing too much. And that's about as much as I'll get in there. All right, osmoregulation. It's the control of water balance in animals. And we have some pretty cool developments here. Um, for example, in a freshwater fish, freshwater fish are hypotonic. Um, they're in freshwater, right? They want to hold on to their salt because they're always getting this freshwater in. So they're going to get rid of large amounts of dilute water as urine, and they're going to try and keep those salt ions inside. Whereas, water in, so they want to get rid of all these solutes that they're taking in with this salt water, and they do that by getting rid of concentrated urine and trying to hold on to as much water as they can. Uh, seabirds, they have a nasal salt gland, which will help them excrete extra salt to get rid of it through their nostrils, so nostrils with salt secretions. And then we have this cutie little kangaroo rat. It lives in a dry environment and it can't lose too much H2O. So it wants whatever water it gets from food, it wants to hold inside of itself. Um, so they will have really concentrated urine. Concentrated urine. Plant cells, again, we have rigid walls, um, so water balance is a little bit different. So rigid cell walls on that side of the cells. And plants are at the mercy of their environment. So if there's low water, they'll wilt. But again, we have those different structures that we talked about, like CAM and C4, to control for water loss. And that is the end of this section. All right.